This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace, mercy, and peace, and abundant blessings to you in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord on this, the fourth Sunday of Eastertide. As we transition from arriving to worship to being present to worship, let us hear the words of the psalmist in Psalm 23, when the psalmist writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters, restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I should walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In celebration of Christ, our Good Shepherd, let us worship God. Let us pray. Almighty God, in this time when we are scattered in proximity, we give thanks for how you sent Jesus, our Good Shepherd, to gather us together making us one people united in one baptism and one spirit. Forgive us for how we have wandered from our Good Shepherd's leading and love. Assure our hearts with your grace that goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And as we prepare for the proclamation of your word, allow us to hear Christ's voice and draw us to his side, that we might live faithfully with him until that day when we are together with all of his fold in endless glory. We ask this in his name. Amen. Let us now continue to ready and center our hearts with a musical offering about our shepherd who shall supply our every need. Our reading for this morning comes to us from John chapter 10, the first 11 verses. So listen now to God's word. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what it was that he was saying to them. So he said to them again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 
I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Here ends our reading. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. With a preschooler in the house, I've become reacquainted with some of the old world fairy tales of my childhood, and I have to say, on the whole, they are deeply troubling. They include stories of households getting slain by giants in their sleep, unborn children being bartered for a salad from a witch's vegetable garden, and then, of course, there is the story of the emperor's new clothes where two men swindle the emperor and his court by promising to weave him the most beautiful clothing imaginable from a cloth that is invisible to those who are dim-witted or unfit for their office. So, of course, the charade begins as no one wants to be seen as either until finally the king parades through the center of town naked until a child pipes up and said, he's got no clothes. It's a story about the power of propaganda in a sense, the ability to weave a narrative that has powerful influence on others and can even cause others to act against their own self-interest. There are grotesque examples of this, of course, throughout history. The Third Reich comes to mind by way of painful illustration. It promoted the aggrandizement of a certain human ideal that boosted a certain civic ideal that promised to raise a country out of the shame and shambles of World War I. It was very effective at winning minds and hearts and contorting the vision of the people for what it would take to achieve the thing that everyone wanted the most. Still today, world leaders can have a funny way of being portrayed as embodying aspects of the aims and ideals of the very thing their country wants the most for itself. I appreciated a commentary by Lindsay Jodry out of Princeton Seminary, drawing from the work of Professor Warren Carter there as well, that helped me think about this text in these terms, in terms of propaganda, though they don't use that language, or at least the propaganda that Jesus was countering with his words. Jesus' words here are often read as a commentary on salvation, so the questions that arise after hearing them invariably sound something like, okay, so who are the sheep? Who is in and who is out of the fold? Is the devil the bandit who climbs in by another way? Who are those sinners who don't know the shepherd's voice? But there are other questions that could be asked of this text, too. Such as, why does Jesus use the shepherd and sheep motif here anyway? What message is he promoting, and what messaging might he be counteracting? The Hebrew scriptures speak of the Lord in Psalm 23 as a shepherd in some of the most arresting, comforting words in scripture. Greek and Roman political tradition also presented kings and rulers as good shepherds who foster a life that is marked by security and abundance for the empire's subjects. Carter points out that it was the emperor who was popularly politically conceived as the shepherd who kept sheep from attack, who secured safe borders, and who cultivated a land of prosperity with their provision. A compelling vision, even though an estimated 70 to 80 percent of the Roman Empire was food insecure. As Carter points out, the Roman Empire claimed to bring wholeness and well-being to society when its structures actually brought sickness and poverty to most of its subjects. It all sounds a little bit like propaganda to me. So here comes Jesus then with a pretty powerful counter-narrative to that of the empire. One threatening enough to the empire at the time to get him killed. Here in our reading, he speaks of himself as the gate, the one through whom that pathway to security and abundance and provision promised by the empire is available. 
And he speaks of himself as the Good Shepherd, a self-identification that, to Roman political leadership, would have smacked of treason. That stirring, comforting narrative was to be wrapped around Caesar alone. So Jesus is indirectly, essentially saying that all those promises touted by the leaders that the people were to obey and trust were propaganda. Not Caesar, not the empire, but him, Jesus. He was the way, the truth, the life. It was not in the way that one passed through the gate of political policy or people or power or promises that one got to abundant life. Abundant life came through relationship with him. That banquet that was prepared in the presence of enemies, those green pastures, still waters, the restoration of the soul that the psalmist speaks of, that the empire promised, all of it came through him. I mean, we're all wondering what gate we have to pass through to get to abundant life these days. Is it the gate of a vaccination? New Disney character face masks for the kids? Is it the gate of a phased-in re-entry plan? Continued social distancing? Alcohol sales are up 55% in the United States compared with this time last year. For some, the gate is being defined as more libations with which to amuse or escape. Domestic violence reports are also up across the globe. For others, the gate is being defined as the ability to exert power and control. What other narratives come to mind that promise you abundant life? Particularly when so many, always and especially now, are food insecure. Always and especially now when so many are contending with sickness and poverty. Always and especially now when you yourself are asking questions about what makes for an abundant life for you and for the people you love. There's a paradoxical aspect to hearing this text in this moment, I think. There seems to be general consensus that this COVID-19 crisis is going to serve not only to widen the distances that already existed between us, but to create some new ones, social, economic, and now physical. And yet Jesus says that there is now an equalizing avenue to abundant life for all in him. And the way to walk that path is to listen to his voice and to follow him. The busy, harried schedules that we'd keep pre-COVID-19, the constant barrage of chatter and things to tend to, the polarized, polarizing political landscape, the rancor on social media, all of it feels so far away, doesn't it? But if we interrogate our memories of that pre-pandemic time, there are, at least for me, some things that I can identify as propaganda. Promises offered up by voices from somewhere outside of myself and occasionally from within about the abundant life that would be available to me if I only had them. And I found many of them persuasive. Yet in this time of sheltering in place and business as usual being upended, and in some cases grinding to a halt, as the volume of all of that that was is turned down, some other things are being given opportunity to rise to the surface and bringing a renewed clarity with them. Some things about the gift and privilege that it is to share life together. Some things about the concern for our neighbor and necessity of beauty and rest and friendship and recreation, literally recreation and learning and art and time with God and enjoying the outdoors. Some things about not just being in proximity with family members, but listening and seeing and praying and playing and eating with family members in ways that lead to intimacy with them. 
It reminds me of when my husband quit his job and his ample business travel stopped abruptly. He had had the highest sky mile status available on all of the major airlines. He was not quite a million mile member, but he was pretty close. So of course he got all these benefits. He got to board first, was automatically upgraded to first class, had the club room access at all the airports, and then of course there were all the things that he could buy with his endlessly accruing rewards points. But when his travel and his crazy lifestyle ended overnight and all of the values and perspectives on what was and what was not worth prioritizing and pursuing ended with it, it was sobering for him to see what rose to the surface, to get clarity on what he had known at some level but hadn't had time to really contemplate. What rose to the surface was the sense that he hadn't been buying into promotions. He had been baited with propaganda that had served as a chaser for the tough pill of sacrifice that we were swallowing day after day. He gained clarity that those weren't rewards points he had been accruing. They were consolation prizes. And they got bigger and bigger the farther and farther away he got from the things that mattered most. Those things that are rising to the surface during this time are offering us some clarity about what makes for an abundant life, or at least they can if we will let them. A good shepherd never shouts. It is not the volume of a voice that the sheep respond to. It is their recognition of the voice that gets their attention, leads them away from danger and along pathways that lead to abundant life. Jesus isn't shouting to get your attention, but he is constantly speaking in a still, small voice through the things that are rising to the surface now, through the way we gain clarity now about what it means for you and for us all to have abundant life. May these strange days afford us unexpected space to become conditioned to the sound of our Savior's voice so that we might recognize it as he constantly, quietly calls us to follow. Amen. Let us take a few moments of silence to reflect on the intersection of the word with our life today.
I thought we could do something different with our prayers of the people this service. I'm going to pray in connection with different places in and around my home. Perhaps as you move in, or in and around your home, you'll find yourself offering up echoes of these petitions. Let us pray. Holy God, the Word has become flesh and has dwelt, has made His home among us. Send the Spirit of Christ to rest upon the places we call home this day. Fill the hours of our day with the aroma of your love and ground our lives in the truth that you are nearer to us than we are even to ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, whose heart is ever open to us, even as our doors are closed now for love of our neighbor and care for ourselves, keep our hearts open to your call of hospitality. Reintroduce us to our living spaces. Show us how they can be for welcoming in and not keeping out when the time is right. Open every door within ourselves that separates us from your presence and your joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of banquet tables and still waters, we give you thanks for sustaining our lives. Thank you for clean water, for stocked grocery stores, for sufficient pantries. Thank you for food pantries and those who provide for them and those who serve from them. Thank you for the many people whose work allows us to have food and drink. Good Shepherd, give provision for those who go without this day, who are scrimping and scrambling to find their next meal. Teach those of us who have much to give to those in need. Teach those of us who have little to pray for those who have much. Lead us all to look forward to that day when we are united in green pastures, when the bandits of poverty and the thief of greed haunt your human family no more. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Good Shepherd of our souls, you are our rest. Give rest to those weary this day from caring for others. Replenish the spirits of doctors and nurses and first responders, all those who put themselves at risk to heal and serve others. Provide peace in those places in our city racked with violence, that your children might sit down and rise up without fear. Take our times of leisure and make them joyful. Give us rest for our souls and help us to stay attuned to your voice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of earth and sky, your eye is upon the sparrow and you watch over every one of your creatures. We give you thanks for the peace of birds, the cleverness of critters, and the resiliency of the trees. In this time, renew our relationship with your created order. As the sheep of your fold, we pray for sheep and cows and pigs and chickens and all those animals whom you call us to care for. Move us to be good shepherds of the creation under our care, nurturing every plant and creature to live in your abundant life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God who redeems, surely it troubles you that we dispose of so much. Thank you for sanitation workers who handle our waste, and thank you for all essential workers who undergird our society. Protect them from illness and from stress. Lift up all those who struggle with anxiety and depression. God of the oppressed, use this time to reform our church and our society, to compensate fairly all those now deemed essential, all those whom our life together depend upon, that our life together might more closely resemble life in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, you are our refuge. Provide shelter for all those who live today without homes and be a refuge for those who find themselves in trouble or in danger. 
Bend our hearts to break for the brokenhearted and turn our ears to hear the cry of the needy. For you hear all of our cries. So fill our hearts and our homes with the words that your Son taught us to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go forth this day in hope and in joy to love and serve the Lord in every single thing that you do and abide always in God's peace. Remember that we did not leave the church. We were sent forth to be the church. So as you do so, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen.